This film is part of Rebel Wisdom's series, The Science and Psychology of Polarization. Peter Levine is known as a revolutionary figure in the world of personal growth. Since the 1970s, he's been working on a set of theories about how the body stores emotion and trauma that became the field of somatic experiencing. His breakthrough book was called Waking the Tiger. He realised how animals naturally shake off traumatic experiences to return to normal, but how humans most often stop this natural healing process, leaving trauma locked in the body. Together with Bessel van der Kolk and Stephen Porges, their work revolutionised the world of trauma, showing how, as Bessel van der Kolk's classic book explained, the body keeps the score and that many mental issues had their roots in unprocessed sensations and emotions in the body. Where did this work originate from? It was a gradual evolution, really beginning in the mid-1960s. But there was a, a seminal event that occurred in 1969, and I write about that in Waking the Tiger, where I was asked to see this woman, I call her Nancy, who had been suffering from all kinds of physical complaints, what we would now call fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, irritable bowel, uh, severe PMS, urinary problems, that, those kind of things, but also severe panic attacks <coughs> and agoraphobia to the degree that she could really not even leave the house, I mean, barely even with her husband. So a, a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, was finally asked to see her. He was a psychiatrist. He thought maybe medications would help. <clears throat> and they really didn't. But I had been working in the mid-60s on some different kinds of relaxation techniques using the body. And I had worked with a number of people uh, who had high blood pressure. And what I discovered was as they had them, if I helped them to release certain muscles in their neck, jaw, and shoulders, very often their blood pressure would go down to normal, sometimes 20 or more points from high to, you know, to a healthy mid-range. So Ed, my, my colleague, my friend, thought that if maybe I could do some relaxation with this woman, at least that would help her with her anxiety attacks. So I began this, you know, getting her to relax these muscles. And, and when she came in, I mean, her eyes were wide open, deer in the headlight eyes and she was clinging on to her husband. And you could see they both felt so uncomfortable with this because, you know, he, I, they were both burdened in a way by the, her complete dependency on him. Anyhow, I started to get, and, and her heartbeat was going at about 100 beats a minute. I could see that and the carotid pulse. So I started to get her to relax and her heart rate started going down and down and you know, when you're starting out, because I was just starting to develop these things in, in, the, in the 60s, when you get something that resembles success, you think, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm so smart, I really know what I'm doing. So I had a little dose of that, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, but uh, delusional attribution. But anyhow, uh, I, I got her to relax, and the heart rate started going down and down, and went right to a normal range. And then all of a sudden it shot up wildly to about 160 beats a minute, 170 beats a minute. And I mean, even as I tell you the story, I start to get a little bit, you know, my memory starts coming back a little bit, my body memory. And anyhow, uh, I said probably the stupidest thing anybody could say, and that's what I said, which is, Nancy, you must relax, you need to relax. But her heart rate did come down except it kept coming down. So 120, 100, 90, 70, 60, 50. And she turned white. And she opened her eyes and they just grabbed onto mine. In desperation, really, she said, Doctor, I'm dying. I'm dying. Don't let me die. Help me. Help me. And at that moment, my, t my, my chest tightened, and I really didn't know what to do. But I did. You're talking about intuition. Um, I, I, at the time, I didn't know exactly why I did it, but here's what I did. I said, Nancy, 
and I pointed to the far end of the consulting room. There's a tiger there crouched. The tiger is ready to spring. Run, climb those rocks, and escape. And to both of our amazements, her legs started moving as though they were running. And we went through different cycles of her hands turning icy cold and then warm. Then there'd be some deep spontaneous breaths. Then there'd be sweating and cold again. And then toward, more towards warm. And over about 30, 40, 30, 30, 40 minutes, she really settled down. And she opened her eyes. She looked at me and she said, do you want to know what happened to me? And like, I'm, I'm pretending that I know what I'm doing at this point. And I, but I said, yes. And she said, when you told me to run, I started, I, my, I, my, I tried, my body start, I saw the tiger, but when my body tried to run, it was like running in quicksand or underwater. And I couldn't move. But when you, as you continued to encourage me, I could feel myself starting to run. I climbed above the rocks and I looked down and I saw not the tiger, but I saw myself when I was four years old and I was held down by doctors and nurses for a routine tonsillectomy with ether. At the, at the time, that, that, was, that was very commonly used. And she had been utterly terrified. Her body had wanted to escape for 20 years. She was 24 when I saw her. And then, using that image, her body got to execute that which she had needed to execute those many, many years ago and experience the, the power and, and ecstasy of escape, but of her own empowerment. And uh, it's, uh, I'm not saying it always turns out like this, but that was the last panic attack, anxiety attack that she had. We did a few more sessions to work with different relaxation. And over the next four, three or four weeks, her physical symptoms greatly abated. And she was able to return to graduate school. She was in graduate school, ironically, in physiology. So needless to say, um, I was deep in a life beginning meditation on what happened, why it happened, and how could it be made safe. Because I realized that I could have just as easily re-traumatized Nancy, we were talking about before, if the nervous system is overwhelmed, in, in terms of how it perceives things, it's not any different than the, than the trauma. So, uh, so Anyhow, I was, in, a, I was uh, in graduate school at UC Berkeley in, in a department called Medical Biophysics, which meant I could go to different, uh, like zoology, in physics, physiology, I could be in these different areas, and nobody knew exactly what I was doing, which was fortunate for me. And um, anyhow, uh, the, we were having a seminar with, with one professor, and, uh, and he, um, he had been talking about a, a kind of a little known phenomenon where if an animal is held down, which Nancy of course was by the nurses and do the, nurse the doctors and nurses, they go into a state called tonic immobility where they're unable to move. It's a, it's a, a state of paralysis. And I realized that Nancy had gone into that state. And then by using this image, I was able to have her basically escape and mobilize the energy that had been locked in. And again, the key here was now was not just doing it all at once, but, but working out a methodology which ultimately became somatic experiencing where you, 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 you and you take the person to their difficult sensations one small piece at a time. I call that titration. And they experience, even though it feels like they're contracting, they'll also be able to then move into an expansion and a contraction and, a and an expansion. I call this pendulation. And these were two of the basic principles in somatic experiencing to avoid overwhelm. 
And so, again, working out a methodology that I could teach to people that had those uh, safety features, you know, built in. We're in this very um, polarized time. We're yeah. all overstimulated all the time with social media. We seem to be stuck overstimulated in this- Overstimulated and disconnected. Yeah. What le light can the lens of, of your work shed on this dynamic? If you're talking to two people who are in the hyper vigilant state, the sympathetic adrenal state, or the shutdown state even more so, you can't engage with them because you perceive them either as threat or as mortal threat because your nervous system is stuck in that groove. And so there's no way you can really listen to another person and, and express yourself so that they want to listen to you while you're in one of these stuck states. You have to be able to come into the social engagement system. And what's the link between your work and polyvagal theory? Well, this is an interesting thing. You know, um, Steve Porges and I have known each other since 1977. And around that time I was developing somatic experiencing. And I was noticing that there were, seemed to be, be three states that people were, their, their nervous system, their bodies would be in. The first is like fight or flight, you know, keyed up, hyper aroused, hyper vigilant. Then there was another one which was really the shutdown and a particular kind of depression. And then there was a state of being relaxed and calm and being in contact. And so um, I, I, uh, Stephen Porges and I made contact. I sent, he sent me an article, I sent him my dissertation. And the next week we were meeting in Los Angeles. He was, at, he was uh, at, uh, in Illinois at the time. And he was coming out here for a sabbatical. Well, we probably spent the first 12 hours just talking nonstop, talking nonstop. And um, we, and, and I, I, I told him about this one state that I observed where people's heartbeats, like Nancy's, went down to a very, very low level. And, um, and that, you know, in order to really work with somebody, you had to be able to get them out of that state. But it was a parasympathetic state, so it was a reduction in the heart rate. And, and he said, that, that couldn't be, that, that's impossible. Then in 1991, 92, the polyvagal theory came out. And indeed, there were very, these three very distinct systems. And Stephen has made such a contribution to all the people who are working in, in different therapies, particularly into body-oriented therapies. And we've stayed close friends for, you know, for those many decades. Could you talk about like, the physiology of this? Like, what is actually going on when we're in these conflicts with each other? And when, because what I also understand is that we stop listening to each other at a certain point. When our nervous system is in the sympathetic arousal state, the fight or flight, um, we will perceive the person, there's no way we won't perceive the person as, as an enemy, as an adversary. That's just the way we're wired. And again, the question is how we get from there to here, here being social engagement, saying, look, you know, we, we, we recognize there are problems. Let's really put our hearts and our minds together and learn from each other and contribute to each other and to rich, enrich each other. And again, the polyvagal theory gives us a very clear map of exactly how that works and what it looks like. You can see the facial expression. When somebody's in fight or flight, they're mobilizing the jaw and the neck is tight. When somebody's in a state of, uh, of social engagement, the eyes are relaxed and open. This part of the, of the, the face is, is the one that's more active or the one more engaged. Okay, so when you're feeling like this, you will not be able to feel like this. So, so again, we read signals from each other's faces, from each other's postures. And if we... If, subconsciously. Subconsciously, all the time. We all do it. We may not be aware that we're doing it, but we're all doing it. And so again, especially if we're not aware, 
then we, 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 we don't realize, wait a minute, the, I'm now in, a, in, a, in, a, in an aggressive state. I, and I, 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 aggressive sometimes gets a bad word, or I call about healthy aggression. But, but in a state of anger or, or fear. And again, that's all we'll be able to experience and that's all we'll be able to perceive and to see. But then as we switch out of those states and come back to our sense of desiring connection with others and caring about connections with others, then it's a whole different ballgame. How do we hack ourselves or hack the, that sort of space of connection? Okay, the, w when I started um, working with people who had been traumatized, this was back in the 60s, um, the definition of trauma was still at least 10, 12, 15 years uh, you know, in the future. So I didn't know, thankfully, that trauma was supposedly a, a, a condition of brain disorder that at best one could manage. So in developing the tools of somatic experiencing, I was discovering, wow, these people can really shift out of these states, but they have to be able to address these sensations in their bodies. Because when, we're ex when we experience threat, our bodies react. Or when we're overwhelmed and shut down, our bodies also react. And until we have new experiences in the body that contradict the traumatic uh, sensations in our body, the, the trauma will continue to play itself from the past in the present and not being able to distinguish between the past and the future, having not imagined, being able to imagine a future different than the past. So, so it's in, in creating these new sensations. So instead of collapse, we experience openness and pride and dignity. Instead of fighting, we, we, uh, we experience collaboration. I mean, it really is that simple. I had a bit of a light bulb moment on a, it was actually a breathwork course that was informed by somatic experiencing work. And the, the, the facilitator was using the words, be curious. Mm -hmm. and, and there was a real, that's when I really made the link between, so we're, we're hosting conversations on difficult topics yeah. and kind of aware that people can go into a sort of defensive mode and curi as I understand it, curiosity is one of the things that brings us into a, a contact. Yeah, can you, you explain can't, what that you means? You can't be curious and traumatized at the same time. The physiology, uh, that doesn't allow them to both be there. So if you can get the client, enlist the client in being curious about their sensations and, 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 and images and feelings, then you've gotten halfway there. Really, really, because the whole key, when you're curious, means you are open to these sensations. You can open into these sensations. Rather than defending oneself against the sensations, God, if I ever feel that, I'll be completely overwhelmed and traumatized. So we, we block them, we suppress them, we hold them down. And you know, if you hold a, a powerful sensation down like this, well, it pushes back up. So then we push back even harder to keep it from pushing up, and it pushes up even harder. There's a saying, maybe it's from AA, that which we resist persists. So the more we push, the more it pushes against us, and then it seems like if we ever let go, we'll be completely overwhelmed. But again, if we're able to titrate this, if we're able to do this one small piece at a time and open to these energies, sometimes I use a slinky, you know, and the, the energy is like compressed into this density of, of energy. And what we want to do is not release that all at once so that that energy just explodes out. Like if an animal, if a prey animal has been um, run down by a predator, like a gazelle with a, from a, a cheetah. All of that energy, because they may lay down as though they were dead. And very often the predator animal would just leave because they're not interested in an animal that might be dead because it's possibly having, you know, disease. 
But again, that then when it, when the when the predator leaves, then the prey animal comes back and just you know bounds away to to live another day and rejoin the her the herd. But with with humans, we become frightened of those sensations. So again, the idea is just opening to one small amount of energy at a time, and and, and do that gently and in a way that the person that is able to ma maintain a curiosity. Mm. And we're talking about this in relation to trauma. Mm -hmm. Is there a parallel? Um, I'm suggesting there might be a par parallel, but is there a parallel in when people get locked in kind of ideological or political conversations where they feel that they can't... Yeah. Um, well, I think if you read Well, they it, feel attacked. Right, exactly. They feel attacked and so they defend themselves. And they def defend themselves so they're unable to then engage with the other. You know, I mean, I think that's the most common thing. We just feel threatened by someone else's beliefs. Why, do, why does that happen? Well, again, I think it's this, the way our nervous systems are wired. Because we will, can be in one of these three states. I mean, we sometimes go back and forth, shift back and forth. But that's just the way it is. That's the way the nervous system works. And again, that's the way the body works. Because again, if we have new experiences in the body that contradict those of trauma, of, 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 of fear, of rage, of helplessness, new experiences that contradict those experiences, then the person moves through those trauma-based states into, hey, let's get together, let's talk. I mean, look, if you and I, you know, I, um, I'm supposed to meet you somewhere and I'm late and you're angry. And if you just start saying, you know, God damn it, you told me we were going to meet here and you were like half an hour late and my reaction may be to attack back instead of saying, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. God, I thought, I thought that actually that I was early. You know, I thought our, the time we agreed to was such and such a time. So we do it, we diffuse the situation. It rarely does any good if people are, who are confronting each other in fight or flight or in this shutdown state. You know, it's an interesting experiment that Ruth Lanius did. She's a, one of the leading researchers in trauma. And she showed a picture of a friendly face, a kind, friendly, open face, to a group of control. And these people were in a very expensive uh, MRI machine, brain scan machine. And when they showed the friendly face, it was very interesting, not a surprise, that the frontal part of the brain actually increased in activity and the, f the fear parts of the brain, like the amygdala, reduced. So then she showed the very same picture to a group of people who had experienced c chronic trauma, in, you know, throughout their childhood. And they showed the same picture and what happens, their front parts of the brain shut down and the parts of the brain that are involved in deep fear, terror, helplessness, uh, that tonic immobility is an area in the brainstem called the periaqueductal gray. That part is turned way on. So you see the, the, the kind face actually then becomes interpreted as a dangerous face because the person is in that internal state. And that's the key. And I think that's where Steve and I came together because his work was saying, we have to look at the environment. Does the, is the environment threatening? Does the environment uh, have the, the, the possibility of mortal threat? Or is it a safe environment? And my way of looking at it is kind of from the opposite, is that, well, whoa, if our nervous system is in more, and our body is in state fight or flight, then we will only experience danger and so forth. So I think it's worth just um, unpacking the word trauma in this context because a lot of people say, well, I, I, I don't have any trauma or it's. Are you, how are you using that word? Is it, is it in the way that I understand it, which is just any experience that feels overwhelming in the moment? That is, yes, it feels overwhelming, and which, which stretches the nervous system beyond its ability to rebound, uh, uh, to, re, to rebound, uh, 
to be re rebound resiliently. And so it really is about, it's about in helping the person develop this capacity for resilience. And Steve calls these neural exercises, kind of the, the things that I do, the way he frames it is, okay, Peter, you have a really great way of evoking neural exercise with these states. So that instead of being stuck in them, we can be curious, oh, wait a minute, my chest is tight, I feel my jaw tightening, I just need a few moments, and then learn, I let those sensations move through, and then I'm able to be present. But we have to take those few moments, or we just go into counterattack. I mean, it's really, that's, it's that simple. This work is becoming more scientifically accepted, but what are, what are the blocks? Is there a kind of, is there still a block around understanding the body's relationship to the mind, or yeah, what, yeah. What, what, are, what, are the, what are the cultural blocks in this becoming more widely known? Well, I mean, we are a disembodied culture, and we are a touch-deprived culture, and that's the way we have our first experiences of safety. And the two cultures that are most touch-averse is the United States and even greater your homeland. So, so I think that's a big part of, of, of which, which doesn't give us this foundation of basic resilience, of having the feeling of being safe. Could you, you mentioned before about the three that, that whether we can take in new information is related to the, the three different states that we're in. Could you just summarize those for, for us? Uh, the only state we can really take in useful information, non-threat-based information, is the social engagement system, what Steve calls the ventral vagal system, the smart vagus. The other two states, we're unable to take in new information. We are simply responding as though the threat that may have happened decades ago is still playing out in the present. And of course, the shutdown state is just hopelessness. We just you know, it's just despair and a deep kind of depression. And again, we don't even have any curiosity or desire even to engage with somebody. And sometimes when the person is in the shutdown state, they need to be able to be helped first to move more into the sympathetic arousal state, the fight or flight state, but then to discharge that, to regulate it, to downregulate it. And then that naturally moves into this social engagement function where we are caring about ourselves our each other and caring about the world and how we're going to leave this world to our children i mean that's something everybody really in principle could agree on but again if we're experiencing the other as threatening ourselves and threatening our economic basis then we're not going to be able to really be open and listen let's take an example of 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 an argument between in a, in a sort of um, political setting or something like that. How do we resource ourselves in the middle of, of that? How do we pull ourselves out of this kind of spiral? Well, it's good to have these tools. You know, when I started working with um, uh, men who were, young men who would come back from the Vietnam War in the 70s, uh, one particular man came in and he, um, it, it's, he didn't even sit down. He started telling me all the horrendous things that he did, was made to do or that he, he did. And when he, he was telling me this, I, I felt nausea, I felt lightheaded, you know, dizzy. And I said to him, I said, you know, Bill, when you told me what you told me, uh, I was, this is what I started to feel. And it's not because I was judging you, because I know enough about war to know war is hell. But I knew what to do. And I was able to move those sensations th through so I wasn't dominated by them. And I could be here in contact with you. Well, I, I had offered to let people come in to do sessions pro bono on Thursdays. And he was the only one that came in that first Thursday. Thursday. The next Thursday, where there was about 25 people going around the block waiting to come in. So we did a group together to teach people the tools to, that they could use to bring themselves and each other out of these shuts, out of these stuck states and back into flow. You know, we really, you could say that we've got, with those tools, without those tools, trauma rules, with those tools, we're able to move 
from fixity to flow. And that's really the gift that we can give both to ourselves and to others. And what, what are those tools? The t those tools are to be aware of what goes on in the body, in the moment, and allowing that to shift, which it will. If we take sort of a, a neutral stance to these sensations, they will change. If we can become even a little bit open and curious about these sensations and feelings, they will change. That's the way it works. If, you know, if there was one main discovery of mine, that would be it. Shift happens if you know how to reference them in your body and you can help each other. So imagine, instead of attacking and counterattacking somebody who said, gosh, it seems like you're feeling upset. I'm just wondering, you know, how you experience that right now and I'd just be really glad to be here with you while you're experiencing that. A lot, it's a lot different. And is it important to name them at the same time, to say, this is what I'm feeling right now in my body? Does that, is that essential for the shift, or is it just, just essential just to notice it? Uh, the most essential is to notice it, but it is important also to be able to name it, and also to communicate it. You know, there's a Motown song. It takes one to stand in the dark alone. It takes two to let the light shine through. So the idea that we can be there for each other. I mean, that was the idea of writing this book, uh, Trauma Proofing Your Kids. It was a parent's guide for instilling confidence, joy, and resilience. Because if you, you teach children how to move through these scary places, then they will be confident adults, confident, caring adults. So to me, we want to get these tools out to everybody, anywhere and everywhere. Do you think that we're seeing a crisis of meaning? Well, I mean, certainly that, that's in play, but I think the crisis is not in meaning, but in being disconnected from our own aliveness, our own vitality. And when we experience our own vitality, we want to share that with others. By just by example, in a way. You know, when you see somebody who really is present, who's really alive, people are touched by that. They're moved by that. So to, and, and when, you, when you've been traumatized, you don't feel this. You feel threatened. You feel shut down. You feel the opposite of aliveness. So do you think we're all pretty much traumatized in this culture? Well, I would say so, yes. Yeah. I mean, there are different degrees. Some people have had the most horrendous things imaginable happen to them. But most of us have experienced significant amounts of trauma. I mean, you know, basically our parents have done the best that they were able to do. But, you know, these are things that have, have hardly been perfect. So it does leave us with, with injuries. And maybe these aren't big T traumas, of, you know, completely overwhelmed, but they are a, Injuries, but that's really what trauma means. The definition of trauma is about injury. We have these injuries that add up over time and these stressors that add up over time. You know, and I'm not talking about, you know, the everyday stresses in life, which I'm, you know, but I'm talking about chronic stress, what's sometimes called toxic stress. And many people in their families feel that. And, you know, and, um, in many cases, the parents don't even have the time to be with their children. I mean, you know, uh, here, uh, you know, the safety net is kind of frayed. And so a lot of people, you know, if, 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 if they live in fear of being out on the street or of having an illness that will completely bankrupt them so they won't even, you know, so they'll lose their homes. And, I mean, it's really, it's a, it's a thing where when people feel that degree of threat, they're going to be responding with the physiology of threat. So, I mean, we do have to see what our priorities are. I mean, you, you know, you're much for, more fortunate. You, you live in a country where we don't, you don't have that degree of, uh, of fear of just, you know, being out on the streets. 
but in many countries, that, you know, that is the case. Your work is hugely influential within therapeutic contexts already. Where do you hope it goes next? Well, I'd like to see it go out in the society in general. Really, I mean, that's where we need it. I mean, these, I, I, in my organization now, where um, I've been talking with the new executive director, really about providing these skills for people who need it and who are in different situations, like people in community mental health. I'm just working a little bit with a group of indigenous people uh, in a mental health in uh, Alaska. I worked in Hopi for a number of years as well. So these are tools that belong to humanity. I mean, I mean, I just happened to stumble along that, across them, but I think they're what you could call, you know, the uh, perennial philosophy, the perennial understanding of what it means to be human. Rebel Wisdom is a new sense-making platform, bringing together the most rebellious and inspiring thinkers from around the world. If you're enjoying our content, then you can help us make more by becoming a subscriber, which will give you access to a load of exclusive films. Also, you can then join our group Zoom calls to discuss the ideas in the films, and you can send us ideas for questions for upcoming interviews. We're also looking for talented people to help us out with editing, graphics, music, that kind of thing. And if you're a regular viewer, you'll know we talk a lot about the value of embodying or actually living out the ideas that we talk about. That's why we run regular events in London. Check out the links on the website for more. And hope to see you soon.